Good evening, everyone. My name's Helen Garner. I'm here tonight to interview our star, which is <laughs> Hanny Rayson. And as you know, we're going to speak about Hanny's new book, Hello Beautiful, which is subtitled Scenes from a Life. And I think we can safely say that it's a memoir. Yeah. <laughs> so Hanny's going to start by reading a passage so that you'll uh, get used to her voice mm. and her concerns. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. It's lovely. It's a little bit alarmed. There mightn't be anyone here. <laughs> I'm going to uh, read a little chapter called Leaky. One of the great mysteries of my childhood was the phenomenon known as women's problems. Chippy McConville's mother had them, and they necessitated a lady's operation, followed by a spell in the country. We kids rode our bikes to the Moorabbin Tip and caucused. My theory was if Chippy's mum had a problem, it was most likely to be Chippy's dad. <laughs> and a spell in the country without him would be just the ticket. I didn't want to ponder the landscape under Mrs McConville's apron. Then my own mum had to go to hospital. This was quite exciting for me and my brothers as my father was now in charge of domestic operations and this meant a, a trip to the Chinese restaurant. Every suburb and country town in Australia has at least one of these. Some have names redolent of Imperial China, like the Golden Dragon or Jade Palace. Many have Chinese names like Wing Hing, Lao's Family Kitchen, and Ching Wah's Wodonga. <laughs> the Chinese takeaway in Brighton was called the Hobnob. <laughs> there was rarely anyone in the Hobnob, so I'm not sure what networking opportunities they were promoting. In those days, if you wanted Chinese takeaway, you bought your own saucepans. We took two, one for fried rice and one for chicken and almonds. I still remember the glory of that meal, driving home, nursing one big aluminium saucepan wrapped in a tea towel, the fried rice at my feet, knees warm, the smell of toasted almonds and soy sauce filling the car. Heaven. My poor mum languishing at the Brighton Community Hospital on a drip. Did we give her a thought? <laughs> at the Moorabbin Tip, Jim Turner was adamant that whatever the nature of the problems that specifically afflicted women, he was certain it involved the removal of some form of tubing. <laughs> Kenny from over the road concurred. He also volunteered that some girls use tampons and others don't. The reason for this is that some girls are leaky. <laughs> I shrugged feigning boredom with the conversation and rode off on my bike over the bobbly landscape of the tip. The prospect of leakiness was disquieting, to say the least. Shame was always hovering over my childhood, the disgrace of being ignorant, the apprehension that my strong little brown body might malfunction and ooze fetid substances, the dread of being mocked. Sex and mockery were almost inseparable when I was growing up. Hey, you, beautiful, a boy would call out on the tram. I would look up. Not you, you idiot. <laughs> Schoolboy laughed that would rattle around the compartment. It occurred to me to counter Kenny's derision about female plumbing with information I'd gleaned from Jan Batty's Home Health Encyclopedia, Vitalogy, 1930 edition. <laughs> Men leak too. They have nocturnal emissions. In Vitalogy, there were several pages devoted to the grave consequences of self-pollution. It was an unnatural and degrading business, and to illustrate the dire consequences of indulging in such an activity, there were colour plates of gaunt and wasted sufferers who looked more like prisoners of war than victims of their own hand. <laughs> These men licked due to their own lack of moral fortitude. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Well, let's see how much moral fortitude we can get out of this book. Quite a lot, I think. Uh, I'm interested, Hanny, in uh, something you say in your prologue. Uh, and I'll just read out this little passage. I just have to imagine you, she says, addressing her imaginary reader, I just have to imagine you tucked up in bed, wanting something companionable and consoling. Iris Murdoch said literature should never console. I think that's bollocks. I'd like to um, get you to talk about that a bit, your imaginary reader. Mm. How did you come up with that? Well, um, you know, one of the things about working in the in writing for the theatre, of course, is that everybody uh, congregates and when you're writing for them, there are 800 people in the room at the same time, if you're lucky. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been working at the Melbourne Theatre Company in the Playhouse and so there are great big numbers. So it's a very public business and, and the expectation that, that you put on yourself about how to uh, shape an event that's going to be a big roller coaster with, um, you know, an emotional intensity and a, and a, and a big shape, big arc, are, um, you know, there, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of sort of pressure on that. And the idea that one would just be able to write to an intimate friend and write with the idea of them um, sitting at home on their couch with a glass of wine <laughs> or a cup of tea and actually that it was um, a, a very intimate encounter was just really lovely and in, and in fact um, I had a really lovely year writing this book you know I, I, I loved it it was um, it, it, you know it was, it was so pleasurable and so different from lying on the floor at home you know my agents might ring me in the middle of the day and say oh you know you like you sound a bit weird are you okay and I have to say, you know, well, you know, that's because I'm a serial killer, you know. <laughs> so the idea of just being able to be myself and um, and communicate in that way is great. One other thing about that too is that the theatre can't sustain um, shy people or um, timid people, particularly. Um, not in a big space, they can't. You have to be a kind of big person to kind of earn a earn a spot in one of my plays, um, uh, someone who has a big emotional life. And sometimes those people can be really exhausting, spending your life with them, which I do. <laughs> it's rather nice just to think that I could have spent a year with sort of quiet people. <laughs> Snuggled up in bed, <laughs> listening while you spoke quietly. <laughs> yeah. That's really well, interesting. Well, it was just... But um, have you always... D did the your imaginary reader just kind of step up or did you have to think now I am consciously going to shape this at such a person or did you just want to think of a, a, a comforting presence that would be not judging you or mm. how'd you... Yeah, there was no judgment. There, there was a number of things about this imaginary person. I didn't have to dream them up. They were just there and that, that person... Because the immediately that, that I feel or a sense of hostility coming towards me, I'm going to be quite defensive and, um, and protective and I didn't want to be either of those things. I just wanted to be able to be free to write this book. So um, the person had to have a share of my sense of humour and uh, <laughs> I wrote a lot of this in the State Library and uh, uh, where I like working. And um, I don't know if any of you are people who use the State Library but one of the things that you do notice there is a lot of people sniff... A lot, and uh, this is the only downside <laughs> of working in the State Library, the only one. So the fact that I laughed quite a lot and loudly was my revenge. <laughs> <laughs> I used to think that if I, if I was writing something that I hoped was going to be funny and it made me laugh, I always thought there was a sure sign that it was no good. Oh. But I've, no, I've recently found this not to be the case. So, you know, you're right, and I was wrong about this. Oh, how peculiar, Helen. But, you know, I, I, see, that's a very interesting thing to me about your whole book, is that you come out of it as a really happy person. And uh, this kind of shocks me somehow. I, I, I feel as if... Um, I, I, feel as, I, I feel as if I, I don't sort of really believe in... Um, you know, I was going to say believe in happiness. I know that that sort of sounds morbid and ridiculous, but I just uh, I kept thinking as I as I read on, I thought, gee, this is actually a really happy person. She is genuinely happy. Oh, did you? I thought you were going to say, you know, I read on. I thought, oh, you know, that 
she's full of bullshit, isn't that? Oh, <laughs> no, at no point did I think that. No, but I... Um, well, for example... No, not for example, I won't go there. I won't go there later. But um, I, I was really thrilled by... Mostly when I read a memoir, the bits that I love the most are the childhood bits, and I'm completely staggered by um, the detail that people can summon up in, in their memories. Uh, I do know that once you start writing, those things start to just float up to the surface of your mind in a way that you can't intellectually do. I mean, it's the process of writing that ca calls up the details. But, you know, w when I came to the bit about people taking their saucepans to the Chinese restaurant, I just cracked up because I'd forgotten that. You know, I know that... You, you, I think you're about 15 years younger than me, so there's a sort of, you know, all, about half a generation between us. And, and But that's not enough to have wiped out the memory of the Chinese <laughs> restaurant saucepans. <laughs> I was thrilled by that. But, you know, just on that stuff about, you know, sourcing your creativity from other places, you know, sourcing it from happiness. I've been thinking about this a bit because I went to the Perth Festival and then um, Adelaide Festival this year and I met Elizabeth Gilbert there. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, in passing. I met the woman who wrote Eat, Pray, Love and then she wrote that fabulous book, um, The Signature of All Things. And um, she's a really great speaker and she's, you know, done a wonderful TED Talk and stuff. And her whole shtick is about the fact that you can source creativity from um, joy that it's not always um, creativity is not only a, um, a source uh, from torment. And this has been really, just her saying that, it's been kind of revelatory for me because I've been plagued by the idea that my ordinary child, one of my ordinariness, has militated against me uh, being able to uh, write well. And, really? Uh, yeah. And, and I remember there was a funny thing by um, uh, Deborah Oswald, the woman who wrote Os um, Offspring, and um, she's just written a new book called Useful. And she said, you know, when she was a child, a teenager, you know, and she realised that her parents weren't going to get divorced. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but parents who don't sunk. get divorced have got all these other interesting problems. Well, indeed. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. No, it's uh, it's right for the picking, whatever. But anyway, I just think that thing of it's a, it was a I don't know. Didn't you feel like that at university that you just had to be sort of plagued by a murky totally. inner psychology? Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, well, yeah. I didn't really have one, so I, I yeah. always feel like I was the girl least likely. But but one thing I notice about you is when you describe yourself as a child. You say you talk about how interested you were in the people around you and how you loved kind of, well, you, did, you sort of jokingly put it as if you were a, a kind of junior spy and, and you loved listening to conversations and um, puzzling over what they might mean and mm. um, and making up stories about the people you saw. Well, you see, I never did that. Uh, and I'm thinking, maybe that's that's the budding playwright in you. Whereas, you know, in, in, in whatever the hell I was doing mentally when I was a child, it certainly wasn't that. I was more kind of trying to get away from people. Oh, okay. Well, that is very different because I wasn't. That's right. <laughs> oh, that is different. Um, so that's, that explains um, why you... <laughs> um, well, I don't know what it explains. <laughs> I don't know what it explains. But... Um, it explains uh, something. I don't <laughs> But maybe we shouldn't go there either. <laughs> but what I, what I was going to say is that it, 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 it is that thing of, of... I remember looking at, you know... But uni when I was in, I was about 18 or something, and thinking, everyone here wants to be different, but I don't want to be different. I want to be in the centre of it. I want to be the spokesperson for a generation, and I want to what? know... What? You thought that when you were young? Yeah, I did. I, I'm pretty sure Whoa. I did. Oh, that is random. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> is that bad? But No, it's, but isn't that what Lena Dunham says, the woman who wrote... Yeah. Um, girls, she says, I'm the spokesperson for my generation. But I would and not I have thought, sex. Wow. I would not have sex on screen in my underpants. Yeah, but she's. I, I think she's fantastic. So I'm really interested to know that you mm. had that feeling. Well, it wasn't like I wasn't a kind of. It, it was like I wanted to know what everybody else. I think it's actually more insecure than I'm making it out to be because it was to do with wanting to make to check that you are. Um, you know the way you feel is the way everybody feels, and that, oh. and, and then, and then, and then knowing that made you feel sort of. Or make, it still does. It really still does. It makes me um, open and feel sort of human and and full and um, normal uh, and and normal. Yeah, I guess I guess it does. Not a freak. 
Yeah, not a freak. Yeah. Yeah, but it's sort of bigger than that, though. It's sort of like also being attached to other people's experiences. And now there's a great thing about, you know, that... Um, I've forgotten who said it now. Um, uh, do I contradict myself? Very well, I contradict myself. Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman, thank yeah. you. I've got him on my in the front. Just yeah, that's how I know. Nervous <laughs> blank out. <laughs> do I contradict myself? Very well, I con- contradict myself. I am full. I contain multitudes. And that's my project, is to find out what everybody's multitudes are. Oh, that's terrific. I love that idea. Uh, there's a lot of... Um, in your childhood, there's a lot of very vivid characters. By the way, when you talk about riding to the tip and you name the kids that you rode to the tip with, do you, did you really remember those names? Did you have to invent any of those names or did they really come floating up and you remember them from your early childhood? Um, I invented the names, actually. There were some boys oh, no. that I wrote... Sorry, I asked that. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, look, there were some boys that... There were some names that I had to change that because oh, yeah, I did ask people, yeah. you know, whether they minded if I quoted from them and they didn't want me to tell, you know, <laughs> beautiful things that they said. Oh, so no. funny it's a, Why did everything. you ask them? Well... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, because I want to be normal. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to be a, a, a pariah dog, <laughs> in other yeah, words. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, yeah. It's, it's all that question about what you value, you know, at, at certain times. Is it worth a cheap joke or to make or your friend feel pissed off with you or not speak to you for five years, that sort of stuff? Yeah. So I thought about those things. But um, what was the question about the tip again? Oh, about uh, the names, oh, the names, the of, names the of the other kids. Yeah, some of yeah. them were uh, that I remembered mm. and um, and some of them I couldn't um, couldn't quite summon. Mm. Well, so you say in your prologue that there are some things that you sort of not didn't exactly make up, but obviously nobody has <clears throat> nobody has total recall mm. of their childhood, mm. and uh, in order so in order to memories tend to come up in fragmented form, so in order to make it readable and enjoyable for people to, to sort of plunge themselves into, you do have to take certain liberties with the so-called truth, don't you? You do, and. You know, I mean, that is another difference between writing a book, a memoir, and a, um, a writing a play is that, um, you know, you think back over the, the, the sort of trajectory of your own life and you don't really think about it as being um, a grand narrative, actually. While you're living it? No. Or in, in retrospect? I didn't think about it as being a grand narrative in retrospect either. I just kept, you know, you just remember incidents. You remember yeah. getting married and getting pregnant and... Um, all the things that, that having um, miscarriages and abortions and all the things that that are meaningful and significant and stay with you and shape you and change you. And th- so those are the things that stand up in a sort of monumental way and you can sort of see the shape of your, your life from, you know, I mean, they're like um, sort of beacons with little flames f- flying on the top. And then there's all this other sort of undergrowth which is riding to the tip. And um, oh, Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, so there's lots of... I mean, there are some things in the in the book which, um, you know, when I thought to myself, oh, all the time I was thinking, of course, I was thinking, is anyone going to care? Uh, that was that stayed with me through um, the writing of this book. But um, when I thought to myself, you know, this is an ordinary life, and then I remembered that, you know, my mother did have um, a, um, a, a man next door was um, uh, murdered and buried under her house. So there were things in our family that were um, perhaps unusual. <laughs> yeah, but that was just a neighbourhood thing. It's not like your mother... <laughs> it's not as if your mother actually killed the guy. Is it? <laughs> no, I, no, I heard Louis... I heard Louis now on the radio and something yes, about a week ago with his new book and, and you know... Um, Actually, my husband was interviewing him, and he said, "Oh, something about your mother." And and she, he he said, "Yes, well, she she uh, shot my father." Mm. <laughs> so you know, yeah. people do have um, dramatic tales. They do. It's true. But then you, you're you, you're. I, I was going to ask you. You you said you thought every day, "Who's going to care about this?" How do you get past that mm. feeling? Um, uh, act of will, really. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is all I what, can. You just grit your teeth and keep going. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is, and um, uh, oh, and sometimes not not often, but you know, read bits out and and um, <gasps> you showed it to people as you were writing it. Whoa! <laughs> Did they ask you to, or you asked them? Yeah, well, you know, I, I'm. I Michael always wanted to read it. He was always 
you know, in fact, there's some bits in it when I, I left the, the um, computer on the dining room table and went out to get a bottle of wine and when I came back he'd written on it. <laughs> it was partly because that was, it was a section about him and he, he wanted to, to claim that this was absolutely patently false and untrue and that he was a much more sensible fellow than I had uh, constructed. And I kept it because it was so funny. And then, so the next time I thought, if I do another book, which I would so love to do, I'm just going to ask everyone to kind of write in it and say, look, this, is, this wasn't true about this was a, a, an appalling oversight and what a dickhead is she. What, you're going to incorporate those responses into the manuscript? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's that's fun. a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of fun and it also gives people the right of reply. Also, that means nobody can sue you because you've already printed their <laughs> objection. Yeah, fantastic. Um, well, obviously, that's... Well, I was going to say that sounds like your father's approach to life, a, a slightly bulldozing approach, but, but um, both your parents, as you depict them in the book, are very strong characters, strong people, mm -hmm. and they're both very appealing, but in very different ways. Do you want to talk about that? Well, uh, my father died. Uh, he had a stroke when I was 18, and um, I, uh, I just got to, after years of you know, nagging and what have you, I'd finally got to leave home. And within two weeks of leaving home, and I went to live at Ormond College at Melbourne University, he had this massive stroke and I had to go back home again. So I didn't really... I felt like, you know, there was a lot of issues that I had with him that um, the process of writing this book meant that I had a chance to sort of claim, claim my father and get to know him and ask other people about him. And this has been very very good, you know, very good process for me. Did but you my find mother is still alive and she's 90 mm -hmm. and she is a force of nature. Yeah, I've met her once or twice. She seemed completely charming to me, but then she's not my mother. Yeah, I know. But, but, but yeah. um, <laughs> no, no, I don't mean that she's a monster. I, I, she's obviously a woman of, of strong integrity and, and she's very funny. But your father is... Um, what was your father's name? His first name? Uh, his name was Bruce. Well, that was my dad's name too. Yeah, isn't that and that's funny? why that's I funny, yeah I felt that I did notice that, and mm. I thought maybe I'd invented it. You know that mm. the, the, the similarity, but uh, he's kind of a almost a ready-made character. Your father isn't he? And he's a bit in that sense. He's a bit like my father in that he kind of goes barreling through the world, mm. and people fall. You know, it's like the parting of the Red Sea, because he they he had some kind of um, Gusto in the way yeah, he approached his that's life. That's true. That it was is a true. very appealing character. The way well, that, that was part yeah. of the joy of kind of getting to know him, I guess, as a you know a, when a, as an older person, really. But um, I'll just read a tiny little bit. Yes, do ab about him. Um, he was a real estate agent, and one of the um, weekend activities was going to auctions in the suburbs. And um, my father would create this incredible drama about the event and, um, you know, with the bidding and all that sort of stuff. And then he'd walk off and um, we'd drive home and he'd say, oh, I didn't get a bid. Well, so it was all, it was all performance. It was well, all performance. It was a play. Mm. And so um, you, real estate agents are not allowed to do that <laughs> now, but they were then and, of course, I'm it made sure it all very... I'm sure they still do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they do too. But they point at this phantom person and, yeah, oh, my God. Yeah, OK. That's, well, that was all part of it, you know. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so there was an aspect of, you know, he was very performative and the, the dinner table was very rowdy and it was hard to get a word in edgeways. And as the littlest, because I'm ten years younger than my next brother, my brother, um, it was, you know, you had to work hard to get a word in, yeah. you know, because who cared about little kids? Everything about my father was impetuous. One winter's night, he came home and said to my mother, it's cold, I think we should go to Hayman Island. <laughs> when, she asked. Tomorrow, he said, I've bought the tickets. <laughs> my brothers were always being inveigled into his impulsive schemes. He arrived home with a dishwasher one night. When the boys came home from a party at midnight, Dad made them climb under the house with a torch and a hacksaw. He couldn't work out how to connect the water. At 3am, they were still lying on their backs under the floorboards, <laughs> soaring through metal pipes, making threads and attaching tubes. Dad had long since gone to bed. <laughs> he made his most harebrained decision on a Sunday afternoon. He announced that we were going to convert our living and dining rooms into one big room. The rooms were joined by double doors. 
In the front room was a roaring fire and Dad thought he could heat the whole house if he opened the space. My brothers were deputised to remove the doors and the plaster. Peter was 12, David was 15. (laughs) Dad wanted to remove not just the doors but the entire wall and he imagined it would take about half an hour. (laughs) Recently, my brother Peter was at our house for dinner. What was he thinking, I asked. He wasn't, said Pete. Then he reconsidered. He was thinking, let's get it done now and we'll have people over for dinner tomorrow night. (laughs) They bolted a six by two Oregon beam across the room for support and Dad proceeded to cut the supporting studs off with a bow saw, the sharpest one he had. He'd cut the first two away with no trouble. On the third stud, the saw jammed. Dad was not to be defeated. He hacked away, he chiselled, he sawed some more until at last he'd wrenched the stubborn thing free. Peter and David looked up. The ceiling was sagging. (laughs) Peter was sent up to the roof to investigate while David and Dad stood there holding up the house with their arms. (laughs) Peter called down through the manhole. He'd found the post, or Tom, that held up the roof. It was swinging. The stud removed with such gusto had supported the entire weight of the roof. Dad was unfazed. They'd worked something out. Then my brother David had a brainwave. He ran outside and got the car jack. The boys jacked up the stud my father had severed. Then they relocated the main roof, Tom, to a more stable support. The car jack remained in place for many weeks. (laughs) Till my father got a flat (laughs) tyre. Prompting him to rethink the pesky problem in the lounge room. And there's this one little other story which is really true of him. A few years later, Dad took Peter to the Brighton police station to sit his driving test. After answering questions about road rules and completing the parking test, Peter got in the car. Dad sat in the front passenger seat. The driving tester sat in the back. He leaned forward and told Peter to drive up Wilson Street past the primary school. Dad made polite conversation with the driving tester. It turned out that he was in the market to buy a house. (laughs) Turn right at the lights, Pete. (laughs) He had a few properties the driving tester might be interested in. (laughs) What followed was a tour of all the three-bedroom houses my father had for sale. Spread over several suburbs, the two men got out, they inspected the properties, they talked, they got back in. (laughs) Head for Sandringham, Pete, my father directed. Got a ripper of a place on Bay Street. You familiar with Bay Street, Joe? By now, of course, he was on first-name turns. (laughs) Back at the police station, my brother had to ask whether he'd passed his test. Dad and the driving tester had completely forgotten. (laughs) (laughs) He sounds fantastic. What I'd like to um, ask you, this is uh, sort of a slight, a bit of a swerve, except that your dad was so, as you say, performative. Um, I would like, oh, wait a minute, I'd like to draw people's attention to this sentence. I have written 14 plays. None of them and all of them are about me. Now, that we could take this one way or the other, but I want to ask you, how the hell do you write a play? I don't know if anyone else finds this bewildering. I know how to write a movie. I mean, anyone can write a movie. But who could, <laughs> but who could write a pl- play? Because you can sort of, you know, there's a camera and it films what's there. But, but, it, but a play is a completely... Like, there's all this space and you've got to make people... You've got to fill it with something. I well, don't there's not a lot get, of space. There's heaps. What are you talking about? In a theatre? <laughs> in a theatre. Well, I suppose, I mean, there's Because more you don't want to have two little people just sitting there saying things. No. Like us. <laughs> but, you know, you need sort of a thunderclap or a car going past the railway line or somebody having a heart attack or something like that. It's well, well, you sort of need those on film. I mean, you, you don't necessarily have thunderclaps in the theatre. But you can have them. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, just in a potted thing, it's different every time... Mm. But um, I, um, I, I like to kind of get a, a bit of an intellectual framework happening first with the theatre. So I'm asking a big question, which I don't know the answer to. That is how I start. And that directs the whole process. So the, the question's got to be about some big sociological phenomenon. So it might be something like, um, um, what is the rural crisis? Like during the Pauline Hanson period, when I was so interested in why Pauline Hanson had some cachet amongst a lot of people, and I 
sort of posed that question to myself. What, what, when people talk about the rural crisis, what, what is that? Because I live in Brunswick Street and I've ne never, ever been into the country. So, I mean, I, um, so I, I, I have something like that. Or, you know, how are men coping with feminism? It's another one. Um, uh, more recently, um, with two brothers, you know, why uh, are, um, how do families produce people who have very different ideological um, bents? Yes. Um, so, um, you know, those sorts of big questions and then I find ways in which um, I will then do research. Well, that's the step I don't get. The research. The, the, the stage between the big question yeah. and how you... Well, I do know that you went up to the Mallee because yeah. you talked to my brother-in-law. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, Patrick. Oh, oh yes, yeah, I did. Yeah, he's from Nye West. Marvellous. Yeah. Anyway, um, be that as it may, um, so, so you've got this really huge, quite cloudy... Yeah. Intellectual, well, you call it a framework, but it's not actually a framework no. yet, is it? No, so, so how do you turn not. it into a framework? Yeah, oh, well, you you think that's what you do. <laughs> I, I actually spend two years writing a play and it's thinking. Um, but are you jotting stuff down all the time? or yeah. thinking? But when do characters emerge in well, your I'm, I'm imagination? I'm doing everything. I'm doing everything at once. So, you know, there's a, I'm, I'm reading and, um, you know, reading around the topic if there's stuff, but I'm, I'm usually wanting to sort of put my finger on a, a very particular sort of sociological phenomenon which is actually of its moment. So there's often not a lot of writing about it. You know, it's just like a question that you know because everyone's talking about it. You're even talking about it with the greengrocer. Like it's... It's important and it's on people's minds and it comes up. So, I mean, it comes up partly because you're looking for it. Like yeah. any research, you, yeah. you start to find that everything is about the Mallee <laughs> when it had never been about the Mallee before, um, for example. Yeah. So you do that. But um, I spend a lot of time talking to people and I interview people formally. With a tape recorder? Yep. Yep. And, uh, and I'm not ever interested in people's theories or necessarily no, their... No, their, you want to hear about their experience yeah, at this point. Yeah, just their anecdotal material. Um, I just want to know about their lives and, and how they put their world together. And because what, you know, what is sort of great is that... When I said before about that contradiction thing is that... I mean, I'm totally unjudgmental. I, don't, I, I'm, I just want them to tell me um, what they feel and what they've experienced and what have you. Um, but I, I, I love the idea that there are people out there who are good people, you know, people who go and work in um, orphanages in um, um, Nepal or something and, um, you know, sink wells and what have you. And then when they come home, they're really horrible to um, their mother in Moorabbin. But so so do you have... Um, the, so the, I, I'm assuming these um, interviews with people would be quite long... I yeah. mean, you get them rambling and you and you direct it or you just follow them? I, I do both. Yeah, yeah, I've got lots of questions and, yeah, so I, I, I do that. And I'm also, like, I am a very... I know that that is my skill. I am a good listener. Yeah. And so I will spend hours when I think other people would go and watch telly. Mm. We're just listening to people talk mm. and I, I, I like that. So mm. that's how I also, you know piece um, together characters that, that I then um, make into uh, congregate, congregate characters. Because, I mean, the thing about writing for the theatre, as distinct from anything else, is that you cannot people the world with a lot of characters. You have to say, I have only got six. Yep. And that's your rule. You know, yes. or I've only got ten or something like that, you know. One of each, as it were. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there is a little bit of, like in television, they call it coverage. And it's true, like, you're just like, only really going to have one middle-aged fat person <laughs> yeah. in this miniseries, and that's it. Mm. You know, we, we, we can't have two. Um, so you are looking to people your world with, um, with the people who are going to serve the story well. Yeah. Not, not, not voice pieces, not mouthpieces for mm. sort of ideological positions, but people who are going to, you know, you can absolutely categorically... Um, uh, you know, tell tell your story with, with mm. just five people or six people. Yeah. I noticed that uh, somewhere in the book you talk about, I think this is when you were sort of in the highest flights of feminism, that you were worried that if, if you wrote a really repulsive woman character who was mean and, and, and manipulative and um, sneaky and jealous and all those other bad things, that if you did that, um, none of your women friends would speak to you after that. 
And I wonder if, um, if that's uh, obviously it's a problem you've solved, seeing you have a lot of women friends. But, um, I thought you were going to say you have a lot of nasty women on stage. No, um, no, I, no. But I am interested in the the problem of of um, I don't know about you, but in, in my generation, we uh, if you started out and became a writer, you weren't just a writer; you were a woman writer. And for really quite a long time in my writing life, I've been described as a woman writer and thought of myself as a woman writer. And I, I, I don't anymore, um, partly because I wrote a book that, that made everybody, all the, a lot of women got really furious with me. And that made me, that freed me from that feeling that I was actually, uh, you know, representing a, um, a constituency, as it were. But I wonder if you have any feelings along those lines that you expressed sort of wittily in that passage in the book, but... Mm. Um, well, you know, that particular passage was about, you know, being working on in screen and, and theatre um, during the time when um, f feminism was a permanent sort of third partner in everything I did, really, and, and if only we would have, you know, women political leaders, we would, you know, have peace and goodwill to all people and universal human rights and... Um, um, we really thought that, didn't we? Uh, we really did. Yeah. And... Um, <laughs> You know, like there's this one moment in Fitzroy, I remember, where we had this women's film night and um, um, it was at a place called the Cultural Palace and um, my boyfriend at the time was um, having a drink at the Standard Hotel nearby and um, I was sort of responsible for this event and there was like heaps of women who were coming, or me and a few other women were responsible for this event and um, they couldn't um, get the projector to work. <laughs> And I kept saying, look, you know, my um, bloke is um, just down at the Standard and he's a cameraman and um, that's his job. And, um, like, can't we just bring him in to find out? Because it was like, the, you know, there was, <laughs> was going to be well, some sort of... The crowd was getting restless. Yeah, the crowd was getting restless <laughs> and I thought there could have been violence <laughs> and any, around the corner. And um, as it, you know, um, and people were saying, we don't need men to tell <laughs> us, like, we know how to um, get the projector to work. It just takes a few more minutes. And um, if you can just be patient. And so I was thinking, okay. So eventually, we um, I, I ran down to the standard <laughs> and got James and sort of uh, spirited him in with his parker over his head, and um, he fixed the problem quite quickly and uh, and then ran away. And then um, we watched our film and it was great. And when I got home, I said to him, "You know what was the problem?" And he said, "Oh, um, you had a box in front of the projector." <laughs> oh, isn't that awful? It's so shameful. <laughs> Um, listen, I'm keeping an eye on the time here and there's a subject I, I did want to ask you about and that's a wonderful thing you say in the book um, talking about step families. There's a whole chapter called Step Families and I, I'm sure there's a lot of people who would find that um, went to their heart. And she says this lovely thing. She's talking about her own family, a big family where almost everyone is divorced but no one is discarded. And I thought, hooray, that sounds like the perfect family. So, do you want to talk about that? Well, it's it's not my immediate family. It's, it's, no, it's James's, James's family. James family, Grant yeah. um, was my first um, long-term partner and he's the father of our son, Jack, who's now 28. And um, when I was thinking about step family, I, I mean, I, I realised, because I have colleagues who are stepmothers or stepfathers, and actually their lives are like Russian novels, you know, like, and then I began to look in, in behind, you know, fences in people's houses thinking, this, there, there is a goddamn Russian novel being played out here. <laughs> like, the, the sort of trauma of it and the expectation that, um, that children will love you as a step-parent and, you know, why? You know, they have their own mother sometimes, they have their own father and the sort of terribleness of devoting your life to children who may never love you. Or you even know, like you. Or even like it's you. It's a very painful And, thing. you know, the terrible way in which divorce demonises people to the extent where I quote something in the book where um, somebody told me that, um, uh, that the, the, the wife was always, the, the separated wife was always saying to the, to the girls, um, now, if your father, you know, touches you in inappropriate ways, you know, I'm at the end of the phone. And really, really shocking, shocking things like that that make, um, 
you know, you would think, who is this witch? But it is someone who, for whom the whole process of being divorced is, um, has just turned them into something terrible. Um, anyway, and that cuts both ways with men and women. It's so painful. Yeah. But the thing that I, I, I think was great about the grants and what initially was that, it, it, like, the events were kind of massive and yeah, all the exes came as well. <laughs> and in the beginning, I used to think, you know, people were really bunging it on. <laughs> that this was not, um, that this, you know, that, that they were pretending. But actually, as I um, got older and, and grew up into it, and I was at 21, what did I know at the time? But as I grew up and I thought, wow, this is so great. People are doing this because, because this is making this incredibly solid family. And um, just uh, uh, you know, when, and when I met my husband, um, he, uh, he was invited to come along as well. And he was like, oh, please, <laughs> you know. And then um, recently... Um, Jack went to London and um, our boy and uh, we had these parties for him and like not only did Michael come but Michael's mother <laughs> and like everybody now is sort of like part of this gang as well because they are fun and um, and I feel like it's almost one of the things that I, I'm most proud of is yeah. about the way in which you can um, raise a child in a village. <laughs> it's true. No, but um, if those big well, families you know work... This. You did that with, with Alice and all the, the the houses as well. Yeah, all those hippie mm. houses we yeah. all lived in, in back in the 70s, that mm. there were so many people there, people who didn't yet have children because we were much younger than... Uh, there, were, there were the single mothers mm. uh, and, and all the women whose husbands... who'd split up with their husbands and who were looking after the children. And, and then there were, there were quite a lot of men, actually, in those households who were the most fantastic... People mm. for, and and w a, a, the very loving relationships developed between the children and these um, the guys mm. who lived in the house and uh, mm. well the, the thing about that is that you know what happens when Jack goes away is that everybody comes because they feel attached mm. you know or when it goes away mm. when you have parties and stuff because people do feel kind of that they've had a bit in in raising well I think it's a great achievement it's um, sort of theory in action which is hard enough. To well, actually, it all, you know, now I'm going to yeah. go online bed and panic about being smug. Um, but because that's always, that was one of the things I really battled with, with writing that stuff. Because, you know, you just don't want to say, oh, well, you know. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't look like that. Listen, I, I, I see it's getting on for time to open it up for questions. But I, I'd just like to ask you one more thing. Uh, there's this lovely motif that runs through the book is the certain camphor wood box, which contains, well, you tell what it contains and how it runs through the book. Um, well, my father gave me the box when I was 14 and... Um, How big is it? Is it a chest or just a box? Yeah, it's a, a chest. I mean, look, actually, you know, it's like a glory box. Size. Yeah, I know. My mum had one yeah. with beautiful smell. Yeah. Mm. And um, it, um, it, it, I'm really not sure whether he gave it to me because he thought I might um, put Manchester in it. <laughs> Manchester. <laughs> As you. <laughs> As you do. But there is no Manchester, but I just used it to put in everything, all my writing. So not... Um, writing for plays or anything, but just um, writing about angsting about boys and, you know, girlfriends and who was in my, my closest group of girlfriends and who was the next circle out and, you know, <laughs> who was at risk of not be being a girlfriend and all the things. And, you know, like a lot of it was, ex most of it, like 98% of it was excruciating. And I had a, quite a hard time in opening it because what I would do, we'd just go... Oh, that and close it. You didn't want to open it. No. But but that's ha that was what lovely about the book was he kept threading the existence of this camphor wood box throughout the story, and then right at the end, uh, you go to that uh, a writer's place down down the um, bay, and you decide that you're going to mm. open the camphor wood box, and it's as if what we've just read is what came bursting out of it. It's yeah. beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Sound. Well, what um, well, it 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 um, that that was true. The RMIT would bequeath this house, beautiful butterfly house at um, Dramana, and I was um, one of the um, or I was the inaugural writer to go down there and use it. So I thought I'll take my camp food box and I will open it and look inside. But it wasn't only just writing. I also had other things in there, like everybody does in there, you know, their stuff. But I I had. Um, um, Bob Hawke buttons and uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Vietnam um, 
little you know buttons and plaques and what have you. And um, I had the I had uh, uh, dried flowers of a bouquet that someone had um, thrown, like you know, in weddings when people used to throw the the flowers, you and if you mm-hmm. <laughs> and then some daggy girl catches it. Well, that was me, um, <laughs> and I kept that in there. I don't know. I've, and then I, I I also had the dress that I was wearing when I met Michael. Hey, can I butt in here and ask if anything, you know, when, when, when there's that fairy story about opening the, well, the myth, I think, when Pandora opens the box yeah. and out fly all the troubles of the world, but there's, I, I wondered if anything flew out of there that you was, wished you had left in the box? Well, I, that's a great question. I think, you know, I, I wished that I was different. <laughs> I wish that I was different as a child because I, I went through a big thing about being quite judgmental of the little girl that was in there who was sort of such an overachiever. And um, and then uh, my friend Elsa Piper said to me, you know, all, all 14, I, I thought that I was inauthentic. You know, I wasn't like being, I'd hoped that I would open the box and I would find real 14-year-old girl stuff. And what I thought was it was, was it was an overreaching person who was sort of keen on, you know, thinking about moral dilemmas and, you know, how to be good and all that sort of stuff. And um, I really worried about poverty and everything. And I do remember my mum saying to me, you know, don't worry, Mr Menzies has got that sorted. <laughs> um, you know, and because I, was, I grew up, I didn't even tell you, I grew up in Brighton. I wasn't so <laughs> posh then, but, you know, it was... Anyway, my mum used to say to me, like, your sign of poverty is when you go to school and look around you and you'll see that, that there are no children without shoes. And so I went to Brighton Primary School <laughs> and indeed there were no children without shoes. <laughs> but I knew she was wrong. I knew that. And so I, I used to wrestle about that stuff. Yeah. So um, the things that flew out of the box, there was a lot of um, wait, time wasting about about thinking about boys, a huge amount of that It's stuff. not wasting time. That's essential character formation, isn't yes, it? Yes, I suppose it is. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Um, I didn't, you know, there, there was nothing in there that made me, um, that, that made me too sort of shocked. I was hoping that there, um, yeah, it was just a girl's box, really. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I've seen it's now, t- we've got about 10 minutes for some questions if anyone would like to ask Hanny. Something? Would you put up your hand and the person with the microphone will come to you? It's not really a question. I read your book before I came and I just spent so much time on the train laughing. It was hilarious. And I just said, I've got to come and see this. It was... it. it brought back my memories of childhood, but it also made me think, this woman, I mean... She went through the same sorts of things that she did, that she did, but she's creative and I'm not. It's so unfair. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> that's a very sad story. <laughs> um, in 1972, we actually moved into Robertson Street across the road from your family home. Good uh, grief! <laughs> and your parents were so much fun. I think you were doing Year 11, 12 then. You were. Melbourne Girls Grammar School. Oh, goodness. <laughs> and you were so quiet. I always remember um, you're always in your bedroom reading. And um... <laughs> she, was, she was a swat. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was studying. <laughs> we actually attended some of your um, parents' dinner parties with Di and John from yes. Manion. <laughs> <laughs> and your father was an absolute character and your mum was a dear. And I remember your dad bought land at Mernignon and then wanted all the thistles removed there. That was land on the way to Ballarat. <laughs> so we all turned up and I'm six months pregnant and they put on a lunch. I don't think actually we removed too many thistles. We had quite a lot to drink and eat. <laughs> that would be right. So I remember your parents being incredibly hospitable, lots of fun, and um, your mum in particular was very down to earth. And um, I remember they actually asked us when they were living down on Beach Road, they, when they left Robertson Street, to come and have Christmas lunch with them. But actually, we had family. 
So, um, oh, that's lovely. And oh, also, I love your comment about the Italian neighbours who was a concreter. Remember the fence in the book you said? It was made out of... He had tree trunks made out of concrete. <laughs> <laughs> So, Thanks, that's fantastic. fantastic. So you've just supported everything that she said in the book. Yeah. yeah and it's all true. Everything's true and your parents brought a lot of fun into um, oh, our lovely. life. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Was there someone else who... Oh, yeah. um, I was just wondering, while you're writing your autobiography, are you also shuffling around other projects at all? Do you sort of find yourself multitasking... And do you have something else now that you've sort of you're ready to get your teeth into, or are you sitting back for a while? Um, uh, well, I I, um, I have a column in the Age now, so I'm enjoying doing that, which is a sort of the idea is plucky girl goes on an adventure. So I'm having fun doing all of those zipping, zipping around. But actually, no, I'm supposed to be writing a play for the Melbourne Theatre Company. So um, I have been. I'm in the book tour has been uh, massive, so I've been um, swanning around in my party dress, talking about myself incessantly (laughs) for the last few months, but um, I am working with the Melbourne Theatre Company in principle and um, the Manhattan Theatre Company on a joint commission on a new play, which is called The Fat Institute. The Fat Institute? Yes. (laughs) That's challenging. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Is there somebody here? Or she's just putting her glasses on. And <laughs> um, there's someone at the back. Hi, I just wanted to say thank you very much for speaking. It was really interesting to hear um, the sort of thoughts that go on when writing. You spoke about um, sometimes you're a bit too judgmental of your writing. And, oh, okay. <laughs> um, and um, how you had to push through that. And I just wanted to ask um, how you got through um, sort of periods of writer's block and, um, yeah, if you just kept pushing through or if you had a strategy or, yeah, what you did with that. Mm. Um, I was just talking about this this morning, actually, because I, I remembered um, once in the age there was this big um, piece about writer's block and the person who I remembered most, um, who said the most useful thing to me was Geoffrey Blaney. And um, he he's very uh, workmanlike about his his writing, and um, uh, he I mean marvelous and and disciplined. But he said that the only occasion for writer's block is it when you don't know what it is you're trying to say. And um, that's not saying that you always know what it is, because that's true to me. That is really true, and that's what you struggle with all the time. What is it that I am actually trying to express here? Um, so uh, very handy to know that it's important to put something down so that when you get up the next morning there is something there to move on with. I find that a useful kind of um, um, idea. Do you uh, mean that at the end of a day's work you stop before sh- you've got to the end of what you had oh, in mind or well, make a little note to yourself which yeah. way you want to go tomorrow? Just so that there's some... Not make a note to yourself, but just so that you've made progress and you've got something to go on with, mm. you know, as a, as a general... Um, yep, yeah, a, a general sense that, that things have moved on. Yeah. Um, and generally I think, like, you know, with research, it's great to write every day. Like, because your you, you, your impulse is to just spend the whole time in the library reading, and you feel like you've done a day's work by doing that. But actually, you probably do need to do the writing every day as well. In your book, you quote E. e. L. Doctorow uh, saying that that um, talking about talking about your book is not writing, mm-hmm. researching is not writing, mm-hmm. um, walking around interviewing, going to interview mm-hmm. people is not writing. Mm-hmm. And but in, he said. Writing is writing, and I would agree with that. But you challenge him in the book, which surprised me. Yeah, but, I but he was you've a, just expressed. Uh, I mean, I love Doctor, but I did think yeah. he was a boring old bean counter. <laughs> <laughs> on that score, I just thought like everything's writing. I just put everything on the tab, you know. <laughs> so because it is all, cons- you, you know, one is consumed by all of these things that to make something, um, you know, if you want to make something big and rich and full and hearty like a marvelous winter soup. Then you um you have to it's all it all goes in everything you're thinking and and then later about. you cut bits out because there's too much in there 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, um, I do. But um, interestingly, like writing writing my book was I was very preoccupied with the word count. <laughs> oh, but that's the terrible thing about computers. You actually can have a word count. Mm. Yeah, well, but you don't you don't think about that at all in the theatre ever because everything's so lean, you know. Uh-huh. That's and that's what I worried about. I thought, would I have enough words in me? You know, like some some people are very verbose and you know write lots and they write in big loopy handwriting. Those kids at school who you know when it's so S a time and then pens down and stuff and there'd be people who'd be saying you know miss can I have you know page seven you know to sort of add to their essays and stuff and I would be excluded extruding one paragraph you know that I would have got like four sentences they would be beautiful sentences but that's <laughs> all so I'm I'm very you know like constipated about the the, the amount of writing that comes out sorry forget that um <laughs> But um, the um, yeah, so in the theatre, you know, I often think that the analogy I have is is like packing for overseas. You know, you lay everything out on oh. the bed and then you divide it down. You know, so you you don't need that many skirts. You only need you kind of work across and you know, take one skirt and reduce the number of undies that you take and all that <laughs> stuff. Well, that's what it's like in the theatre. Everything's so you know clean lined and make your point efficiently and cleanly and perspicaciously. But you can you can crap on a bit more in in a book. That's interesting because I don't think you crap on in the book. But um, well, well, in fact, well, what happened was that actually you know the word count was interesting because Michael Haywood at Text, who was just wonderful through the whole process, there are two Texties here, um, um, editors, both brilliant women. Um, they um, you know they said uh, they set the benchmark and said you know look. 60,000 words, and so I'd be creeping up, be creeping up, and it, was, it reminded me of, like, raising money for the children's hospital. You know, like one of those sort of mercury things that goes up with the, with the levels going up. I thought, oh, God, I'm nearly there, I'm 40,000, 45,000. I got there, 60,000, I made 60,000 words, how incredible. And then when I went in and he said, um, he said so look, you know, when you've got 80, um, you know, I, I thought that was just, like, totally shifting the goalposts. But um, anyway, then I found that I... I had 90, so... And have you still got 90? No, it's 80. <laughs> but um, there's 80 there. Yeah. Well, I had to take out 10. Yeah. And, um, was that hard to do? Yeah, it was hard to do. Although, there was, this, there was this story which I really want to use somewhere else. Just a really quick thing is that where I grew up in East Brighton, there are 10 major Australian writers who grew up within a kilometre of my house. Wow. And um, that's uh, David Williamson, Rob Drew, um, Peter Corris, John Romerill... Um, Patricia Cornelius is a playwright. Um, Elliot Perlman on the corner. Like, it was really amazing. So I've sort of pondered about that. And that, that was a big, thick essay because I, I, you know, David Williamson was just hilarious. I rang him up and said, you grew up just near me, you know? Like, did you go to the Middle Brighton Baths? And he went, oh, absolutely. I was the water gauge. <laughs> like this... <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, at primary school, they used to send me in to find the depth of the water. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Um, I'm noticing the time now, and I think really we've used up all our time, so I'd like to thank you, Hanny, for being so wonderfully oh, entertaining you, and Hanny. diverting. <laughs> thank you very much.